The architecture, because I'm not, I'm not quite sure where you draw the line between art and architecture. And I think my, my ambition is to kind of overlap both and then let people figure out themselves. I don't really mind how it's categorized, but it's, it's more to keep it fluid and fun. And also, um, this talks about resilience, so more so the resilience in trying to sustain quite an artistic practice when you'll actually make more money doing very boring house extensions. Like conservatories, you can make a lot of money. Whereas trying to do something a bit quirky or different is difficult to actually sustain a practice. So you'll see, you'll see some of the methods of I've tried to work through to sustain a practice. Um, so this is app architecture. It started with um, three of us from undergraduate. So we're all friends, so be very careful who your friends are at undergrad, because um, you might well start a practice with them. Um, so yeah, we all worked very well at undergrad, and we always did like um, design competitions and weekends and things. So um, there was Zora, John, and Paul, but because uh, JP didn't work very well. We called him American John because he's American. So it's Zora, American Paul, mm -hmm. American John and Paul, so Zap. And actually, consequently, I'm now the only director. So it's just me and four employees. So this is the office. It's um, Shoreditch House. So Shoreditch House is like, a, it's kind of an office space environment in London. It's run by the Soho House Group. And it's, they only admit designers, fashion designers, architects, actors, um, graphic designers. So everyone there is like a community of artistic people, which is great. And it's actually led to some fantastic collaborations and work. And it's quite difficult to get in, but by chance, I actually did some design work for them. And in return, they let me in. So, um, and I guess we had our big moment last year. The Architects Journal named us as the young ones to watch last year. So that was quite good. Um, so yeah, student, um, I, think, um, I think it's quite interesting to see when someone comes back to talk how being a student relates to actually being in practice. Because people don't actually see what the, they think it's either a massive jump or it's, it's so different, but actually it's not that different. And what you're passionate about as a student, I think from what I've seen, it just bleeds into whatever you do once you graduate. So I just, I'll show some very quick stuff I did when I was at Sheffield. Um, I was obsessed by hand drawing, so I loved hand drawing. Um, and that, that was a second year project in Edinburgh, which I believe a lot of the second years are doing housing, similar housing project. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Sheffield was great because it allowed me to kind of, you, you can explore these things and actually you, it's a time when you never get back because you're in the working world. So if you really want to explore something and push it, now is the time to do it. I realized that and I kind of have massive regrets for not pushing further when I was a student. And then it becomes so useful then when you actually go out into the real world. Um, so this is my kind of CV. I left Sheffield. I was in, was in Russell's studio and Carlin Butterworth's studio. Um, I left Sheffield and went straight to Grimshaw Architects, which actually from these images looks quite dry and infrastructural. It's like, uh, London Bridge Railway Station, Reading Railway Station, Heathrow Airport extension. It's very dry, very kind of almost scientific and clinical. But these were the reasons I was brought into Grimshaw. But then they utilized drawing skills to become, I basically became a competition monkey. So I did all, I did all their competition entries, which was really, really exciting. But also late nights and say goodbye to weekends. Um, then I went from Grimshaw's to Sarah Wigglesworth, who was, who's a fantastic practice. Um, much bigger in the press than you'd actually believe the office size. It's like a really small office with maybe four to five people. Um, but her exposure and her, I think she's in the, amongst the 100 most influential people in the UK this year. She's like, for such a small office, I'm amazed at how, how broad reaching her ethos is. Um, so she was like the smallest practice I've worked for. Um, but also one of the best, I'd say. Um, so this was a school, this was a Smithson's project. She's quite passionate about architecture. And she let me have a go at trying to save this old Smithson's building called Robin Hood Gardens. So she actually paid my wages for a month while I had a go at salvaging. Basically, it's beside, it's beside Canary Wharf and they want to knock it down. 
Um, and she tried everything to keep it saying that, well, actually, if you stick some flats on the roof or some apartments above the garages, you can actually get more units per square meter. Um, it didn't work, so the council are knocking it down, but it kind of proves how passionate she is about architecture and about iconic buildings. Um, and then I went from Sarah Wigglesworth to Hopkins. Um, so I got a tiny stint on the Velodrome, which was great because I got free Olympic tickets. Um, and then Hopkins were kind of reaching into residential, which they'd not done a lot of before. So I got to really cut my teeth with most of Hopkins on large scale housing and residential, which, um, yeah, it was good fun. I think all three of these practices were very different. And it's, it's quite good to see how various practices work. And it definitely comes from the top down. So some, some bosses or some directors are like, we'll work you to the bone and you're going nowhere really, you're not producing a lot. Whereas some are just really nice and pleasant and you can produce a lot more. Um, it's interesting to see how various bosses work. Um, but if I had to pick, Sarah Wigglesworth was definitely the most influential. Um, and then, then, so these are three different practices I did drawings for, and these are all my drawings, but I just wanted to show this to show that all the styles are quite different. And when you enter a practice, you almost have to adopt the style of the practice. So almost in every practice, I had to retrain, retrain myself how to use a pen, because it has to match the, the drawing style of the office, which sounds a bit weird. But um, you kind of get into it after all. But that, that's something I didn't expect. I thought you just draw like you always draw. But that's not the case. Um, so this is an interesting project. Um, whether it's architecture, I'll let you decide. Um, Shimmy Nightclub. It was a nightclub in Notting Hill. Um, it's been going for about 10 years. And it's right across the road from really valuable houses, like five million, six million pound houses. But the nightclub was actually basically a child nightclub. Like it makes the Harley look like the Ritz. It's just like, uh, it's, it was attracting very, very poor clientele. Not poor financially, but just bad people. So there was lots of, <laughs> there was lots of uh, stabbings and kind of social issues outside. So they lost their license and the, the owner contacted me because he heard I could do like a bit of graphic design or maybe. So his plan was to, um, so this is it. Like, it's, it's like a basement bar and nightclub, but bizarrely it's got a really late license, which is really valuable in, in somewhere like London. So um, he didn't want to just close the nightclub, but the council was slashing his hours unless he did something. So he rang me and he's like, can you design a new logo? And he's going to put a new shop front entrance. Like he thought that would solve all his problems just by putting a new logo and rebadging it. Um, so I did the logo. So that's, that's it. So you go in the front door and then there's a the stairs down and it's, it's just a weird club. It's like terrible. Um, so this was the logo I did. So the club was already copyrighted and the website had been bought and the club was called Love Shimmy. So I just designed this logo, Love S, Love Shimmy, and then kind of took a bit of initiative and turned the logo into the door handle. And then just just because I was bored, I made like I made some clothing and merchandise and I did a website page for him. Um, and yeah he, he really liked it. Um, but he still had no idea that I was an architect. He just said, okay, you're, you can do graphics, so um, we'll use your logo. Um, and then he had a small budget to put the logo up, but he spent a huge budget on a public relations officer. So this is someone who's got a, an iPhone full of Kit Moss's number, and, and basically they, they set out like, lots of um, kind of feeders to get people interested, and they drum up some publicity. So he actually spent a lot of money on this company who invites all the celebs thinking that if you invite enough rich celebs and actors that that'll get rid of the chavs and it becomes an exclusive joint where the residents aren't so annoyed about these people coming. Um, so yeah, I took, I kind of went one step further. So when I finished the logo, I, I did a kind of branding exercise because you have to go down these stairs. So I kind of sold this idea that it's almost like Narnia Enchanted Wood type thing where you could go down and it's more imaginative and it's more artistic. Um, and I'd also watched uh, that movie, The Great Gatsby, that week. So it was, kind of, it was almost in vintage mode. Um, so, yeah, I just did a vintage kind of thing with the logo. Um, 
So this is the nightclub. Oh yeah, so the press woman was really, she really, really liked this and she convinced the owner to spend loads of money in refurbishing the club. So, and he had absolutely zero faith in me, but um, because this press woman told, told him I was good, he just employed me to do the entire work. Um, See, so that's it. So one of the ideas was, I've got a table in my house, which I bought from Scrabble tiles. And I just introduced this idea to the club. So I bought 7,000 wooden Scrabble tiles online. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, my housemates think I'm nuts. But um, so we we, um, we tiled the top of the bar, so the bar counter is made from Scrabble tiles. And I got all my friends down, and everyone was like spelling rude words across the bar. And <laughs> there's some poetry, and there's some. So when people are ordering drinks, they actually loiter at the bar, and they actually order more drinks. Funnily enough. Um, so yeah, that I got a license through the bar, um, and then the client kind of got some faith in me. And then I got, pretty much got free reign to then design the club. So this was the wall previous to, to us getting involved. And um, to make it look vintage, I, I like the idea of just illustrations everywhere, because the budget wasn't massive because he spent so much on the press officer. So um, I just drew all over the walls like a child. Um, so, so, there was no builder who would kind of get involved because they thought it was a bit weird. So me and my friends, we actually, we tiled it ourselves and then I did the drawings. And then we were just trying out new things when the plaster was drying, we'd put ships or anything we could find in a skip, we'd stick it into the wall to make ships. And it just kind of gives the illusion of 3 d I suppose. Um, so that's it, finished. And the budget for this was tiny. It was, um, well, it was 30 grand, which won't get you a lot nowadays, um, to do a full club refurbishment, um, and that's it. So this is the ladies' bathroom, so went around antique markets and actually bought loads of antique stuff. Um, the Narnia wardrobe occurs at the bottom of this there, so when you go down, we actually got loads of vintage clothes and put LEDs inside them. Um, so it creates this kind of mystery and kind of it just sets the scene for something. So by the time you reach the bottom of the stairs, you've already lost loads of inhibition. And that only leads to like a good time inside. It's actually a good fun club if you ever get a chance. Um, well, this is the other thing the planners, Westminster Council hated the owner because, because of all the trouble outside. So one of my ideas at a planning meeting was to devote the window to local artists. So every month, a different artist displays artwork. So it basically becomes a public kind of paving the dark gallery. And then the locals suddenly, you can see them kind of coming over and having a look. So rather than hating the place, they started to really engage with the place. And actually some of the local residents have bought artworks from the artists. And we only allow students to exhibit, so there's no like rich, famous art artists. <coughs> and yeah, this is, this is also kind of, we drew on every surface. So anywhere where there was white walls, we just drew on them. Just permanent marker and black paint. And then just varnished over the top of it. So everywhere has got like, illustration and artwork. That's the door to the ladies' toilets. Um, um, that's the way out. So yeah, we just, almost like children, just spent two months drawing everyone. Um, and that's the stair as it was, and then this was it. So um, yeah, that was that. Yeah. So these, these alcoves existed when we entered, um, really tastefully done. Um, <laughs> so. Um, we kind of asked, could we have permission to like just completely rip everything out and go again? So this is James. James was a part one working in the office. And he was like working in the office on his own while I was in the club drawing on all the walls. So he asked, could he come down and get involved? So I was like, all right. So this was his design actually, it wasn't my design. He came up with the idea of laser cutting MDF and then painstakingly creating these spacers and angling two sheets of MDF. Like he did every one of them by hand, and as, as the glue was setting, you have to hold it for about 30 seconds. So he, he did the entire alcove, and um, this was the result. So yeah, his, his part one portfolio looks good because he's got, and he designed this, um, it's like a Victorian silhouette. So he created this window where um, you just cut out with a scalpel, just cut out some shapes and you can change the scenes behind. So punters who are having a drink can get these private booths and they can actually substitute the scene behind. So this was all a part one's idea. 
So let me just let him go for it. Why not? Um, so this was the this was the wardrobe idea. And yeah, on opening night, we got these people done. Mm -hmm. So um, that was quite cool. It's only got a capacity of 100 people. So um, yeah, I actually had to beg to be allowed on the guest list after spending two months sleeping in the place. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this was good. And it, it even came to the drinks menu. The, the owner just let me design the drinks menu. So um, I got to go to cocktail <laughs> tasting and from what I remember. It was, it was good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is the front of it. Um, yeah, so there's no, there's no garish logo, there's no garish like text or signage. It's just you've got an artwork in the window and the logo is the, the door handle. Um, that's, and the hedges were an afterthought because drunks were sitting on the side during the day. So once we put the hedges on, it just got rid of the drunks. It was kind of trying to find architectural solutions to solve problems. But it's getting good reviews in Notting Hill. Um, Oh yeah, so from, from this night, I got talking to some fashion -y people, um, possibly the bitchiest people in the world. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I got an invite to do London Fashion Week last, last week. Um, so this was a Barbie house, so the idea was a shoe seller. Again, questionable if it's architecture, but I kind of seen it as like almost a, a horizontal section of a hotel. So I just, the design was, it was just like a plan or a section through and you've got these various rooms and in each room you've got a model. Uh, the model stuff wasn't like, they've, they've got designers who do all that. So I just had to create the actual envelope. Um, so that was it. And the whole, the whole theme that I was given in the brief was to create like a Barbie hotel. Um, so I basically had to draw everything, Photoshop, signs. Um, so each room had a different character, there's a bathroom, yeah. It's good fun. There's models everywhere. It was horrible. <laughs> um, uh, and then this was this was previous to Fashion Week. This was Wallpaper Magazine. We're doing a shoot. Um, it was inspired by Julia Schulman, who's one of America's kind of foremost architectural photographers. So a lot of architects became really famous, and you'll know a lot of their names. Um, this is a great movie, Visual Acoustics, if you ever get a chance to see it online. I think it's online. Um, I went to the premiere last month. But it's one of the best architectural movies I've seen in a long time. Um, basically, this guy was a real egomaniac. He was a great photographer, but an egomaniac. And I've always thought that Frank Lloyd Wright, Neutra, kind of Gary, they all pushed their own designs forward. But it was actually this Californian photographer who took photos of their buildings and he's pushing his photography so much that that's how the architects almost became elevated to public kind of consciousness. Um, it's a really good documentary movie if you get a chance to see it. Um, so this was for Wallpaper. It was a furniture supplier and Wallpaper magazine who wanted to create this shoot. So it was replicating some of the scenes in a lot of Julia Schulman photography. Um, the fun part of this was there's no actual concrete or marble in the set. It's all painted and it's all like stickers and it's cheating basically. It's, and it's, it's like artificial lights outside Perspex. Um, but I found this really good fun. It was like almost, it was a movie set. You're basically trying to create a realism within a very false environment. Um, and there was absolutely no Photoshop involved in this. It was all lights, um, painting. Kind of. Some of the shadows are actually painted. It's really, really interesting. Um, uh, this is another one. So that's just like loads and loads of la light stands outside this Perspex kind of frosted glass. And I think people would be, well, I I'm quite filled, but I'd be forgiven for thinking it's a, it's a genuine 60s shot. Um, it's also down to the photographer. I mean, the photographer was unbelievable. Um, that's another one. Yeah, so I've kind of gone off on a tangent from architecture to these kind of almost set design. And then this is something that we just got permission for to do in New York next month. Um, it's a big outcome, I'm sure some of you have seen it in London. Um, so you get to design an Easter egg, and it, it gets hidden all over New York, and then kids travel around New York trying to find the various Easter eggs. 
Um, the one in New York, this is Orzan. So the one in New York uh, is for mental health charity. So we designed the egg with mental health in mind. So it's about a vulnerability or a fragility inside the egg. So from the outside, it's all really gorgeous and sexy and curvy. And from the inside, there's a delicate egg actually suspended over these spikes. So it's kind of a, a metaphor. It's quite a dark metaphor for mental health. Um, but the New York uh, organizers liked it. Um, it's quite daunting because it's there's three eggs side by side, and ours is in the middle. And it's DK and Y on one side, and Tommy Hilfiger on the other side. <laughs> so, and this is just a render. I have no idea how to build it. Um, uh, this was a project I did with Sheffield. Uh, basically, I was a client for a group of students doing a live project. I think some of you might have seen this. So it was Pavilion of Protest, which was um, these students kind of came up with the idea. So I was the client, and they had to produce an artwork about student fees and the rise in tuition fees, and basically making sure that it's not just rich kids who go through architecture school. You've got loads of rich kid architects who are designing public buildings for people who are not rich kids. Um, so these guys came up with it. I thought it was a really clever idea of this. Um, so this is how much, we did a survey online, and this is how much it costs to get a part two degree on average. Um, that's not just London, that's anywhere in the UK on average. Um, so 88 grand, and I can tell you, you'll be quite a while waiting to see that back. Um, so the idea is that there's a student working really hard behind this mountain of debt. And within that mountain of debt, they're, they're kind of etching away and producing this long drawing that flows out. Um, then the drawing, I think it was exhibited here for quite a while, wasn't it? Yes. And, um, the Reba archives actually liked it so much that they want to keep it in their archives, just as a frozen snapshot of this moment in time. So that year when the government trebled tuition fees, this is like a visual document to, to document it. Um, and then we had a big opening night, which was good fun in London, and a big party afterwards. It's good. Um, this is the biggest project I'm on right now. It was um, while I was working for Hopkins, um, we did a competition to design an entrance to Dublin University. And um, we won it, so that was, I mean, that was the best news ever. If you're just, you're a part two employee working for a big company, you get a phone call to say you've won the one million pound sculpture. Um, it, was, uh, it was a good day. Um, so um, when we went, I went to the prize giving, and I think they were quite, <coughs> the clients were quite freaked out by how young and kind of inexperienced we were. Um, but saying that, they, they had full faith in us and they actually let us, they're like, you know what, just go for it, do your best. So the clients actually are the main reasons that has become something right now. Um, so this is the site, it's the whole campus of Dublin University and the entrance is here. Um, but the entrance actually looks like the entrance to an industrial estate, not like a a world-renowned university, and it is quite a good university. So they needed like almost like a shop window to attract people, and they're actually trying to attract foreign students, but when the, the front entrance looks so poor, cool, um, it's really difficult to design a cool prospectus. It's just, it looks crap. Um, so this was our design. Um, and there's a whole romantic poeticism behind it that each, each post represents a single student, but together as an institution, it's very strong. And each post is a varying height with the idea that every student's different and in a university not everyone's the same. Um, so that whole poetic romantic thing is what won the competition. So we're, the wheels were in motion to fabricate the posts in Germany, um, get them shipped over. And we discovered at one of the meetings that the university <coughs> had planned on nailing just a big sign on the front of it. So once the posts were assembled, they planned to just like bolt in a very average sign. So, this, <laughs> these, these are two friends of mine from when I graduated, um, but there was a queue outside the sign on graduation day, and that kind of got me thinking that it's the best PR for any university, because everyone's got this in their, in their home. So I was like, why don't we create an actual, really sculptural, cool sign that on graduation day students want to be pictured with? Um, so the idea was to create this concrete, 3D lettering spelling out the name of the university, Dublin City University. But the annoying thing was the the president really loves this logo, but everyone else thought it was crap. Um, 
and he wanted the logo to be the 3D sign. But we tried to petition him from an architectural sensibility and say, well, over a few years the logo might change. So couldn't we just have the letters and the logo can maybe come off at some point? And he's like, no, no, I think it was his nephew who designed the logo or something. <laughs> um, um, but it looks like a first attempt, attempt on Illustrator. Um, but, um, so we, we, we argued, we, had, we physically had proper shouting matches and meetings about this. Um, and it was 50-50 amongst the crowd. Um, so one of my ideas was the Channel 4 idea that from a certain vantage point it all lines up and you actually get a logo. But we were really determined if we had to do this ugly logo that there would be something quite cool about it or quite, I don't know, dynamic. Um, so basically you ripped off the Channel 4 idea. Um, and so the, the, the logo appears on the post behind, but only from one point. So otherwise it's quite an abstract thing. It's like fragmented, no one really knows what it is. But from one killer vantage point, which is directly in parallel with the letters, you get this amazing like, photograph on graduation day. Um, and they're just like carved niches on the post. Um, it looks really good at nighttime actually, because when this lights up, the light catches the grooves. It looks really, really nice. Um, and lo and behold, it worked. Um, yeah, so they had graduations two weeks ago, and the sculpture's not finished at all. So it, there's a guard. I love Arden because there's a garden centre down the road and the guy in the garden centre just brought all his trees behind so it's like a building site but they just put loads of trees around this little bit that's built and all the, all the stu students like lined up and the photographs actually look okay, not too bad. Um, um, and oh yeah, the president who hated this idea, he was like against it from the off and um, he's like okay we'll do it and he looked really grumpy when they did it because it's quite expensive, concrete letters like this are quite expensive um, he was really, really grumpy. And then I was there on Monday and I was walking out the other entrance of the campus. And on the other end, on the other exit, the, <laughs> I, I didn't even know about this. The, the, the concrete factory had been asked by the president to use the same mold and produce another set of letters for the other entrance. So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So this is it. This was the first post. This was a fun day. Uh, the posts arrived from Germany, they're 16 metres tall. Um, they had to close Dublin City <coughs> Centre on a Sunday to get them driven in. So they came off the, by boat. And then from the port, they had to be driven on a special lorry. And they had to close Dublin, which was <laughs> quite, quite big fun. Um, so that was the first one, and a big crowd came out to see that. That was Sunday Times in Ireland on Sunday. Um, and that's them. So they're still far from complete, but we've got, we've got a month to finish them. And Bill Clinton is giving a, a lecture in Dublin that day. So he's actually going to open them, so that should be quite good. Um, and this is our latest project, which is on site. Um, it's also in Ireland. It's, it's where I'm from. Um, it's quite a dark one, this one. So there's a tiny budget to create an intervention in a forest park. It's really scenic. It's like one of Ireland's, uh, I think it's one of the top areas of natural beauty. But ironically, it's got the highest suicide rate in Ireland. Um, so rather than just create a sculpture, I wanted it to be something about a social problem. And when I proposed this, the judges literally crapped themselves and like, oh, it's too contentious. It's delicate. We don't really want to. It's a nice idea, but it's too contentious. And then at a meeting, I just kind of said, well, if you don't talk about it, you're just perpetuating the silent kind of under, it's kind of the silence and not talking that causes this problem. So rather than have something dark, it's just like a nice place to enjoy nature. And all it is, is this is the, this is the rise in suicide in the last five years in Ireland, which is directly related to the economic recession, um, I think, anyway. Um, so it's about elevating that percentage of people to a higher level. So. It's just a lookout. It's a nice place to enjoy the view, but the concept is you're elevating this percentage of people to a, to a more exhibited view. And the floor is, is um, we created pizza slices because it's a circular site. So there's 12 pizza slices and each slice goes to a local primary school. And the kids all stick one cent co cents in Ireland. So they stick one cent coins. Um, and then we pour resin over it and it's kind of giving financial value, little respect, so you actually walk on money. It's kind of 
the whole, the whole tagline was that Ireland's richer than the financial problem. It's like richer visually with the landscape. Um, and that's, that's kind of it. Um, and it, because the site occurs in a crossroads, we've got a nice poem by Robert Frost about decisions in life in crossroads. Um, this is another one. So John, the guy I started up with, he's just been headhunted by Apple to create the new donut in San Francisco. You know the, has anyone seen that? The, mm -hmm. Serena lives in San Francisco. And this is a competition we did last year. Um, actually, Cassandra worked on this. Um, so we did this last year, and it got nowhere simply because the small print in the competition was you've got to be an American student to enter. <laughs> so we spent about a month on this. Um, but since John's gone to San Francisco, he's brought it. He got asked to present it to the mayor of San Francisco, and they're actually quite interested in it. It's a disused motorway. Um, it's kind of like the New York skyline, but it's a disused motorway that um, it links different parts of San Francisco. And without this actual connection, it's quite a contrived route to get to the city centre, to get to Market Street. So these neighbourhoods down here are quite degenerated and poor. So it's just a link, basically, in its most basic form. Um, yeah, so John's actually in discussions now about this with San Francisco municipality. And that's it. So thank you. Great lecture. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? I think it's going to be more informal this time than last time. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? <laughs> well, um, also, what kind of projects do you aspire to do? Um, I'm getting really into sculpture. Um, but what, what I haven't shown here is actually, we do do, we've got three house conversions on the go right now. But I just, I almost see them as a way of sustaining the practice, then testing ideas. I want to test ideas, but most people who convert houses don't want to splash out on some architect's ideas. To, to a point, there's nice detailing and you, you give them what they want. But yeah, what I haven't spoken about is there are conventional projects running in parallel. But I am get, I'm getting quite excited by more artistic stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I just want to know if there any any opportunity or the chance to work with you guys because I really am <laughs> interested in art and artist stuff because I I dread painting on most of the choices and the lanterns and the or I I paint and everywhere I can find a place to make a drawing or paint up and I really enjoy it and uh, yeah. I think it's kind of my direction I'm going to do because I don't really interest in the construction of architecture stuff. Yeah. So I'm sorry for that but <laughs> I, I, I love doing the creative but stuff so I, I want to know whether there's opportunity to there's, work. There's never a window for, I mean I, I had to push loads of that stuff. Send us uh, a Yeah, send us a degree. <laughs> Careers as of architecture. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no window for that. I had to basically just get on the right side of clients and almost, actually a lot of that drawing work I did at night time, I was sleeping in the nightclub and he came in one day with the builders and there was like a big oil on the wall. <laughs> and, yeah. But once it was up, they didn't ask me to paint over it. So, and then that led to the next one and the next one. Yeah. You spoke about, uh, so surely it counts? Yes. Um, how much of an influence has working with some collective environment been on the work? It's really good, yeah. Um, if you, I mean, I've always got Photoshop or Rhino or CAD or something open. And people actually wander past and go, oh, you're an architect. And they just start a discussion. And sometimes they're textile designers, and sometimes they want to see their pattern, their textile pattern. Well, speaking from last week's experience, this girl wanted to see her pattern on the side of a building. She wanted to see what it would look like photoshopped onto a rhino model. Like that, that just happens. And no one's going to pay you for that, but it's just a nice exchange kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> oh, yeah. um, I'm not 
Yeah, you discussed kind of the idea about the boundaries between art and architecture and they're quite blurred. Yeah. If, you, if you had to give an answer, what point would you think that architecture can sculpt from the first place? I think, well, personally, I think good architecture should be sculptural. Mm -hmm. um, there's also, I mean, I've been studying um, the Viennese guy, Adolf Luz, who talks about ornament and crown, and there should be a pure architecture. And if you have to go painting on it or drawing on it or putting fluffy material on it, then you've obviously failed in some respects. Like, you're just tattooing a building that should look quite sexy in itself. Um, but often, these projects, you inherit an envelope which you might not like. I, mean, I think I'll only cross that bridge when I get to design a building on a brownfield site. Because um, right now I'm dealing with envelopes that I don't particularly love. And I'm just almost tattooing them. Um, but yeah, I, I do think good architecture should be sculptural. Simon, You mentioned at the start about um, how your collaboration uh, began with people who you met in the of course. Yes. And I just wondered if you could say a bit more, and it's obviously quite important to you making those connections and relationships. Yeah. So I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, I'm not only my undergrad, actually, my postgrad also. Um, because I'm almost like, I'm on my own now. We started as three friends, and now I'm on my own. And then on a Friday night somewhere in London, I'm in a pub with some, some of my Sheffield mates who we, we live together up here. And they're like, do you want to do a competition? And we just do it. I spent the last four weekends with um, a guy who studied here, Paul Westwood. Um, and we're doing a competition. Um, yeah, because you actually, I looked at I looked at my colleagues when we were in third year and thought, all right, he's good at this, she's good at this, and I thought it was just in my head. I wasn't sure if it actually equated to the real world. But then they grow up, they become architects, and they're still good at that, except they're much better. And actually, if you're starting an office, you want the person who's good at this and who's good at this. And when you see a seed of something, I think at university. You can, I often thought it was just in my head, but then other people say, oh yeah, the guy John, for instance, is amazing, amazing at rendering. But he always was, and then when you get older and he gets better and better, you're like, oh, he, he was good at rendering. That's his bag. I think some certain people have, and actually John, John basically used me because he thought I could hand draw stuff. So it's not using, it's using each other's skills. And then Zora, the girl, she was an amazing speaker and businesswoman, and so together we could, Collaborate. It was like a good, yeah. good dynamic. Um, but yeah, I think, it's, I think it's really important. And actually, you find out the best. I'm sure it's cliche, but the best tutors are your peers. You just learn from each other. You should probably go to all of each other's crits. Um, um, yeah, go to. Uh, yeah, you learn more from. I learn more from my colleagues than I did from tutors. No offense, Russell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Excuse me again. Uh, I just want to know, uh, uh, you get many projects, it's because you are an architect or you are an artist. Many artists have told me that I should not give up like being an architect because people will trust you, give you projects because of your ar architect instead of the artist. But they, they, they think that artists can only do the painting, do the I don't know, romantic stuff, because, but they, if you need a project, you, you need to be more practical, more skillful, something. So I, I just want to know how to balance the two. It's a, trick. I mean, it's, it's a good question, but what, what is an artist? But that's, that's the question. Because every, every idiot walking around Shoreditch who thinks they're cool is an artist. Um, <laughs> but they actually, I, I love asking them what they painted or what they've done recently, because it turns out they haven't done very much. What they call themselves artists, while their mum and dad pay the rent. Um, yeah, I just I think I judge people on their previous work, um, and I think clients do that too. They want to know what you're about. So, like double, I mean, the titles. The titles. Um, like artists and architect, the combination. Of I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah. <coughs> I was just wondering what um, proportion those conventional projects that sustainable practices have compared to your more artistic projects? Um, the conventional ones are always going. They're solid. Uh, uh, do you know what the proportion roughly is compared to those? Uh, I can tell you right now it's about 
but next week it might not be. It depends when the artistic stuff comes in. <coughs> is that time-wise or financially? Um, time-wise. Um, financially, it? the artistic stuff, it's like, it's not, yeah, we're better off doing conservatories. Um, <laughs> um, but I'm actually getting to a point now where people are approaching me, they're commissioning me to do artistic stuff. And that, when you get, I've, I've noticed when you get to that point, it's not the sob story you actually can charge a good fee for. Um, so it's, it's horrible, but you probably have to take a hit for a while before you can charge. Yeah. What's, what's your kind of, um, just generally, like, um, your outlook on kind of working for free? Um, um, I mean, I know you, you got approached, you said you got approached by a woman who wanted to see a photo shop um, on a pattern. Yeah. Um, and she couldn't do that, but you could do that, and it taking five minutes. Yeah. Uh, that's valuable. Um, how do you kind of see the, the, this kind of tricky situation in the planning of your work? Um, and, and I would say you, never work for free. Yeah. Like, you're actually doing everyone in this room an injustice if you work for free. Because mm -hmm. um, some, some other firm will take free people. And that means your mate who refuses to work for free will never get that job. So, so in, in terms of like kind of when does collaboration um, stop being collaboration become work for free? You know, so like, um, so collaboration should be collaboration. You sh should mutually benefit from it. That girl who put her pattern on a building, I really like the pattern. Like, I, I couldn't do that pattern. So I got to see what a cool pattern looked like on a building. Um, and I might use it for something. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. What was the main reasons or um, like your turning points towards your changes in different firms and like did it lead you to a direction or a certain style in your future projects? Um, yeah, I suppose it did. Like, like, yeah, you learn so much working in practice. Like, did anything cause your uh, decisions towards the, like, the types of different, four different firms that you, you changed throughout? Um, each firm works very differently. That, that was a good thing to see, how differently they work. Mm -hmm. So somebody talks about, yeah, I was a part two. Like, their experience is not the same as someone else who was a part two. It, ne it never will be, because each firm works so differently. Um, but yeah, you can learn, you learn so much. I mean, in many respects, I'm nowhere near ready to start my own practice because I have a lot more to learn, and you learn it working in a big firm, you def or a small firm, you learn. But it's just um, winning that competition kind of almost forced me to start my own thing. Well, if I didn't, it would be a waste. But I'd have to give it to someone else. Um, but yeah, I, I would never think I'm ready to start a practice. I think I could have done another 10 years in a, in a, big, pra in a big or a small practice. Um, but now I'm kind of feeding my way, rather than being guided. Yeah. I'm just curious to know how many competitions you had to enter before you started to actually winning them. Absolutely, that's a very good question because we had a we had a meeting last week. Because competitions don't make any money, and if you lose, you just wasted a month of work, or you could have been you could have actually been doing conservatories and earning money. <laughs> actually, you could have been working at McDonald's and earning money. Um, so we're trying to like get a strategy where Friday is competition day. And then if you really could be arsed or bothered at the weekend, you just continue Friday's work. Which generally happens actually, we generally give it a Saturday or a Sunday as well. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, competitions are way more fun than real work. They're just like student projects, just wacky and fun. But no, you couldn't run a practice doing competitions. But also you can't win a competition without giving it everything. I realize that you have to like work really, really hard. Um, yeah, it's a really, it's a valid question. So right now,